and you wouldn't know them if you didn't listen. And you know, this is and th this family lives in poverty by Boston standards. They hail from another country in the Caribbean, not not Haiti, another one very close by. In fact, connected. And uh, <laughs> but they were living in you know American style poverty. And and again, I, what strikes me is in both of those instances, and in fact, in all three instances, Haiti on the the audio interview, Guatemala. Um, and, and this one from Boston, is there's goodwill all around. I mean, there's no question that the doctors and nurses in Haiti wanted to cure the patients of TB. And there's no question that the, the neurosurgeon, for, I mean, the neurosurgeon, there are neurosurgeons in other hospitals who say, we're not going to operate on people with AIDS, you know, because it's not worth it. That, that would never happen. As I've never heard it once happen at the Brigham. And so a lot of effort, and you know, I would, didn't do the math, but if you were an economist, and you were studying this, and you'd say four admissions to, uh, you know, uh, one of them to an intensive care unit. You can only imagine how much it costs to do a bad job. How much does it cost to do a bad job? How much does it cost in terms of mental health problems to do a bad job after a war? How much does it cost to do a bad job promising people in rural Haiti that they will no longer die of a readily treatable disease and then to fail? How much does it cost to do a bad job with people living here? who have to face racism, gender inequality, linguistic problems. And that, I, I think, is, is, if there's a, that's the theme that I'd like to bring out from these examples, is that it costs a lot, and we, and we still don't know how to measure how much it costs. The intervention I just mentioned, a community health worker. Now, uh, when, when the Haitian community health workers found out the ones in Boston actually had cars instead of donkeys, they were amazed. And the cell phone thing really blew them away. But I, I, I won't, wouldn't be surprised if 10 years from now, uh, if I am spared and invited back here, that I'll report to you that the Haitian health workers also have mobile phones now. That'll happen. And a lot of them, I got an email at the Brigham from my community health worker just about three hours ago. And I just left there. Um, and this is the intervention. You know, you go to someone's house and, and, uh, and make sure they get their meds. And, uh, and that's, that's really, and it's been impossible to fund. People have said, well, you know, it's too expensive. The salaries for the community health workers are too, exp too expensive. And we've been saying, we need to scale this up. This is important. We said it's important for the city. You know, it's important for the teaching hospital. It's important for Boston Public Hospital, uh, Boston City Hospital, everywhere. But it's been very difficult to fund because it's, it's held to be too labor intensive and too expensive. And the reason that it's considered not too expensive in Haiti is because the labor is so cheap there. But otherwise, you, you know you'd be hearing the same thing, thing, thing there. Same thing there, and I'll give you an example from. Now this is in between, in a way, uh, in extremity. This is Peru. And we, we ended up there through a, a, it's a long story. Um, they all are, I must say. <laughs> but it was, uh, again, another one of those freakish things, too bizarre to imagine someone comes back from this area related to partisan health and up and dies of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis after working in the slum. Dies right here in a in Boston hospital. Now, that does, that's not something you see very often in Boston, I'll tell you. Someone dying of tuberculosis. And, uh, and so we went back to the, to the place where he'd been working in, in this, you know, into this community and we found all these people who look like this, and this, this the, the doctor here is actually not a doctor at the time, but a third-year medical student, Sonia Shin, who is now, I'm sure, one of the world's leading experts on tuberculosis, on this particular form of tuberculosis, but on any form of tuberculosis, is Dr. Sonia Shin. Um, but this is probably eight or nine years ago, when she was a third-year student and one of, the, one of the patients, and we found hundreds and later thousands of young people who had what's called multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And some of you have heard this story. I don't know, I, even here I've told this story and I, I promise to tell it in abbreviated form, but we, the point here is, here you have again a picture of this bizarre term audition. Only this is not auditioning for a Broadway show, this is just listening. And here you have a community outreach worker, this time a Peruvian, not a Guatemalan or a Haitian or a Dominican living in uh, Dorchester, but a Peruvian community health worker listening to one of the patients tell his story about what it was like to be told that he had a disease that wasn't treatable and that he ought to just give up. And it, you know, this is an example um, you know, of how clear it was made. And this, was, this is policy. You know, this is being set 
by people like me. You know, MDR-TB means multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, but it's too expensive to treat. You know, it's not cost effective. It's not a perfect technology. The, li the list is long. It will make you think of another disease in a minute. And should you not think of that disease, I will force you to in about two minutes. <laughs> but now, the big question I think that comes up a lot if you're listening to people living in poverty is they almost never say things like this. I, I, well, let me just put it more starkly. I have never had anyone tell me in Haiti or Peru or Russia, Doc, if that's the disease I have, forget it. I'm then, you know, whatever. I'm Haitian, and it's not cost-effective to give me the stroke. <laughs> Never once. I, only, but, you know, I hear it regularly outside of said sites, usually in sites like these. And, you know, it's, it's important that we, hear, we don't hear this from people living in poverty. And not just people living with the afflictions, but people living in poverty. And, uh, and again, that's part of the, the tension that I'm trying to describe between our world and their world. Because I don't fool myself for a minute. I mean, I live in a, poor, a village among people who live in poverty, but I'm not poor. I can take American Airlines and get upgraded on my way back here just because I fly there so much, you know, and have bad red wine in first class within, you know, four hours of leaving, you know, said miserable squatter settlement. I, I, don't, I don't have confusion about that. I do not live in poverty. I will never live in poverty. And even though I did have a couch outside, I never did live in poverty. Now, is this, these kind of comments are never heard from the people I'm talking, saying we should listen to. So, it, but say for example you wanted to take the first one of these and say, well, it's true, isn't it? I mean, it, look at that. It says, in developing countries, people with multi-drug resistance tuberculosis usually die. Well, that's true. It's not a false statement. Because treatment, effective treatment is often impossible in poor countries. Also true. But is this the beginning of a conversation or the end of one? <clears throat> and if you were to make it the beginning of one and you'd already worked for some years in rural Haiti, you'd say, well, hey, why don't we ask the community health workers? And some of you will recognize Jim Kim, who was here just a few days ago, and will be back here, I think, on Thursday, who is now head heading up a major effort to scale up some of the interventions that you're, you're hearing described here that, that come from listening to poor people. But these are young people. This, by the way, I'm just trying to get an assessment here. Is my hair really falling out that fast? No, this is 1997. Um, this is 1996, actually, I think, 1996. Um, and these are um, young people from this neighborhood. And they, be, they became, they did the work that I described being done in Roxbury and Dorchester and Haiti and, uh, and elsewhere. They started delivering the right medicines to the people who needed them. Now, and was it impossible? And did it require... And, and, and after all, if I'm working in Haiti in 1996, 97, and Jim and I are all over the place, how, how could we be providing the leadership? We weren't. This is Dr. Jaime Bayona, who is the director of Partners in Health in Peru, who will also be here Saturday. I, and uh, um, we're having, actually, all of you are invited to a symposium that's called Collateral Benefits. And we're going to talk about what happens when you try to start virtuous social cycles in places like, like these ones, on Saturday at the medical school in this giant new building that was recently built on Avenue Louis Pasteur at 8, at 10, nine, nine. at 9, 9 o'clock. <laughs> anyway, you're all invited. But this is Jaime Bayona. He'll be there to talk. And he provided leadership and helped transform Partners in Health uh, Peru into uh, what I believe is Peru's largest health NGO, the whole country. I, I think that's true. And there was, we had to pull together this coalition, and this is a boring, boring slide that involved, you know, who makes the drugs? Well, the pharmaceutical company makes the drugs. You know, and you, um, sanctimony wins you nothing, you know, if you're struggling for poor people. So I can say, well, the, the, the drug companies are never going to give us drugs. They're never gonna, but that's not very helpful to people who need the drugs. So we didn't do that. We, said, we kept on calling them and calling them and faxing them and emailing them. And one day they said to us, okay... We'll, leave you the, we'll give you the drugs already. Will you please stop faxing, phoning, calling, <laughs> pestering? And they did. They gave us the drugs. And then we, we were shocked for a bit, you know, and had to, you know, sort of rally ourselves, saying, wait a second, that wasn't supposed to happen. But it did happen. And then we, we actually said some other things. Maybe we'll have time to talk about it afterwards. We said, well, help us transfer the technology to poorer countries who have this problem. And they said, okay. And then we realized that we really didn't know a lot about technology transfer. And, Again, we're a little bit shocked, but you know, let this be a lesson. I mean, it was a lesson to us. Again, another one of these epiphanies. This one, I think, coming in a way also from poor people who who were saying, "Go get the drugs." I remember in 1996 when it was clear that combination.